Hey all, hope all is well. This is another video in the Road to Grandmaster series. And this one I'm going over my round four game from the Southwest class uh, event that happened in February 2019. If you've been following the tournament thus far, you know that I have two and a half out of three and just survived a really, really difficult game um, uh, in my last round against uh, Guillermo Vasquez, where I was just much, much worse in a French and really was just lucky to survive. Um, this time around, uh, I was playing up again, um, this time against a grandmaster originally from Poland, I believe, named Camille Dragoon, I think is the way you pronounce that, and a uh, very, very strong player. I think he's close to 2,600 feet A, and uh, just a really tough opponent. Um, the reason, actually, that he was in the United States is, again, he happened to be among the contention that goes to one of the Czech universities. Um, I'm not sure which one he goes to, but I think it's one of the schools in Texas. So again, we have this influx of talent from other parts of the world playing in open tournaments of the U.S. because uh, they get full-ride scholarships to go to some of these institutions. So in any case, I was white, so I was hoping to get some pressure on the guy and uh, see what happens. So I opened with d4. Camille went knight f6, knight f3, e6, c4, d5, knight c3, and now bishop b4. And bishop b4 is the start of the Ragozin um, variation, um, a very, very popular line these days and very much computer approved. Um, there's a lot of theory involved, but uh, the, the general gist of things is this aggressive uh, move pinning the knight actually is pretty well justified because you're putting immediate tension in the center. Some positions you might even think about taking on c4, and you're just playing very actively from the jump. And uh, in addition, the lines in the Ragozin are actually a favorite of uh, Alpha Zero, um, the strongest computer pro pro program in the world that kind of took the world by storm um, a year and a half ago when the first games uh, between Alpha Zero and Stockfish were released. And Alpha Zero was popping out the Ragozin and with black and getting re very reasonable positions. So, very much a modern, modern line. Uh, I went for c takes d5, resolving the tension, e takes d5, and the most common move here is, to, is bishop g5, um, pinning the knight, um, but instead I went, I went for bishop g5 in this position, but after that I decided to go for a different plan, um, which entailed after h6, bishop takes f6, which is a little bit controversial. The point is you're giving up your bishop pair but you're thinking that maybe you're going to misplace some of black's pieces because this pawn on d5 might be hanging. So after queen takes f6, which is the logical move because I can't take this pawn because my knight is pinned, um, I play queen a4 check. And this is the idea is that now this bishop on b4 is a little bit loose. I'm challenging it. There's only one way to parry the check and defend the bishop on b4, which is knight c6. And in this position... White is arguing that this knight on c6 is very misplaced. Um, it is doing a job guarding the b4 bishop, but typically you don't want your knight in front of your c pawn in d4 openings. And so the idea is White is trying to misplace black's pieces and argue that the time it takes for black to untangle will allow White to get some advantage. I must say I probably did not look at this line deeply enough because it actually turned out that black was able to untangle relatively quickly. And um, yeah, it, it was very surprising to me how quickly black was able to untangle. I thought there would be an enduring advantage here. So anyways, nothing's been spoiled yet. I went eight e3, um, black castle, and I went bishop e2, just developing. Note that I really want to just castle and threaten the d5 pawn. Um, and I figured that a move like, uh, like let's say I play a3, I can force this exchange because, I'm again, I'm hitting the d5 pawn. So uh, black would need to take this, uh, this knight here. But I thought in these types of positions, um, a3 would be a little bit of a waste of time. And, uh, yeah, I just didn't feel these types of positions with my pawn structure a little bit broken. Although these pr are probably acceptable for me. Um, I just didn't want to go for them. In hindsight, a3 maybe would have been a reasonable option. Uh, after, anyways, I went bishop e2, uh, and black played rook d8, and this was actually a move that really surprised me. Um, I was really expecting the pawn to be defended with bishop e6, 
But the Bish Bunny 6 is a little bit passive. It's just defending that pawn. It's not on the most active diagonal, which would be f5. So um, rook d8 is actually a clever way um, to try and uh, defend that pawn and not put the bishop on this weird square. And now that the d5 pawn is defended, I don't even have pressure on it. So this is just a really nice way to finish the... Uh, this is a really nice way for black to develop. I castled... Um, and now black played bishop f8. And this, I think, is the key setup, is that this bishop goes back to f8, which is a really, really nice square, just tucks it away there. It's, it can't be harassed by any of my pieces. And then maybe in some circumstance, the bishop might pop out to g7 or maybe to h6 if, uh, if black actually starts to push the kingside pawns. And in the long term, these bishop pair will be a serious trump if I'm not able to get something going in the center in the short term and take advantage of this knight on c6. So I think this was really, really well played. This rook d8, bishop f8 maneuver I was not familiar with. Uh, and it's just, I think, an excellent, excellent plan. So... I have to try and get something going um, on the queen side while this knight is misplaced. And so I was really thinking, okay, maybe I could try and rattle off a minority attack. I could try to take advantage of the half-open C file. And that's kind of where my counterplay was going. So I started with rook FC1. Um, I thought this was a clever move. The idea was that um, I have two ways I can put a, uh, to put a rook on C1, but I thought it'd be better to put the F1 on C1 because maybe the a1 is still can still play along this file. The other consideration I had was that this queen potentially could back up and go to d1, and that that might be something that is uh, that is enticing to help my queen get back to the king side and support my king side um, with my rook still being connected. Whereas if I go rook a c1, if I ever want to bring the queen back, my rooks aren't connected. So I thought that was the nuance playing rook fc1. So rook fc1. A6 was played. That's a good move. It's honestly a bit of prophylaxis against uh, a future B5 move. Um, and it's really it's really going to be hard to get off uh, the B5, uh, to get to get this B, B pawn pushed. Because at the end of the day, I need to support it with A3 and B4. And even then, if I play B5, um, after A takes B5, the black rook will have really good influence on the A line. So... It's really unclear if the minority attack really even gives me anything at all. Um, and I started to see that uh, I wasn't really feeling this. But I have to go for something anyway. So I played a3, you know, trying to justify my setup. Knight e7, another excellent move. Rerouting this knight um, from the c6 square that was very poor. And now there are two actual routes that the knight could go. The knight could go to g6 and potentially to h4. Um, but also the knight could consider going to f5 and then to d6. Um, one rule of thumb in the minority, uh, um, with minority uh, pawn, um, pawn advances, particularly in the Carlsbad, is that if you have a knight on the d6 square, the, uh, the, the minority attack just doesn't work. And the reason for that is from d6, the knight would eye e4, it would eye c4, and the all-important b5 break. So if black is able to set up pawn c6, knight f5 to d6, um, b4 just doesn't, b4, b5 just doesn't really get anything done. So yeah, I was already a little bit aware then. I was kind of wary about, uh-oh, this black is actually getting their pieces uh, to the right squares pretty quickly. So I went queen d1 because I, I kind of reasoned that the minority attack might not be as rosy here as I thought it would be. And... Black went knight f5, excellent move. And again, knight g6 is also an option, but again, this knight on d6 um, is just so good uh, in these types of Carlsbad structures, which it has wound up transposing to. I went b4, trying to play on the queen side, and now black went g6. Another very good move. Um, also giving the king some luft on the g7 square, and Additionally, thinking about advancing with potentially h5 and h4, trying to create a little minority advance uh, of his own on the king side while I do some stuff on the queen side. The difference is I'm trying to get something positional going on the queen side where black w would be going for my king. So very, very tough to deal with. I went knight a4, keep this going, and now bishop d6. And I 
totally underestimated bishop d6 because um, now that my knight is actually not hitting the d5 pawn, it's a totally justified move to put that bishop on the diagonal. Um, I, my h2 pawn. And the other thing that's nice about bishop d6 is you're not playing c6. Um, so what I anticipate with knight a4 is, oh, oh, black is just going to play c6 and uh, to defend these uh, this d5 pawn. And I thought, oh, great, then I can get knight b6 in, trade this bishop, and get uh, a kind of playable position. Although I must say black is even probably fine here as well. Um, I thought, well, at least I'd get rid of one of the bishops and I can play this one for a little while. Instead, with bishop d6, black is not even giving me that square. So I think that's a good choice. I went knight c5, getting into the c5 square, and that was kind of the dream of this whole setup was getting the knight to c5, eyeing the b7 pawn. Now the bishop is kind of frozen. But um, yeah, just it's not, it looks nicer than it actually is because now black played h5, and you could see that black is trying to you know, create some type of incursion on the king side, whereas it's really tough for me to follow up with my knight on c5. I went a4 trying to keep the minority attack going, and now black went king g7, and you can actually see that some storm clouds are brewing. Um, rook h8 is a potential idea, getting the rook to the, um, the h-file and pushing on the h-file. Um, g5, g4 might be an idea. Um, h4 might be an idea. Knight h4 is an idea. And in the meantime, again, what if I have to show for it? Well, if I push b5, um, maybe black can even lock the queen side with a5. Um, if I push a5, black can, uh, like if I play b5, black can probably lock like this. And if I push a5, black could even lock like this if they want. So, Again, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit here, and that's not ideal. Uh, after king g7, I went for knight d3, thinking that, you know what, I have to kind of, you know, stem the pressure here. Maybe thinking about blocking on uh, e5 would be a way to go. And now black played knight h4. Good move. Getting rid of a defender near my king side um, makes a lot of sense. I should have played knight fe5 just to make, uh, just to block the bishop like this. Um, I rejected this move because I was very wary of queen g5. I just thought this pressure was kind of, you know, threatened checkmate was kind of menacing, and I didn't think I wanted to play g3. So if I play g3 here, the knight just goes back, and I thought now I've created a target for um, the h pawn to advance. So. I was wary of this type of move, but maybe this was a little bit better than what I did, because what I did kind of sped up Black's game on the queen side. Uh, I went knight takes h4, and after queen takes h4, well, I have to go g3 anyway. So it might have been better to have this knight on e5 to block the bishop and then play g3 uh, instead of this line. So after g3, the queen just backed up to f6. But again, you could see that like this h pawn is rolling, Rook h8 is an idea. Um, both these bishops are... Ugh, I'm so bad at arrows. Both these bishops are lined up against my king. These are big problems. I went b5 trying to get this minority thing going. And black went h4. And I was like, uh-oh, this is very dangerous. Alert. h takes g3. Rook h8. This is the some checkmate ideas. And I thought, I have to try to trade some pieces. So I played bishop g4. Um, the one benefit, if you will, about playing moving the h-pawn is at least I could trade these light squared bishops. I expected, actually, bishop takes g4 tra helping me trade. And then with my queen on this post, I thought I'm actually covering many of the weak light squares in my position. But black actually played a much stronger move, um, which was h takes g3 first. Um, I have to recapture here because of check. So I play h takes g3. And now bishop f5. Um, very, very, very strong move. Point being is that white's not helping my queen get into the game. Um, instead, black is going to just post up on the light squares himself. And the other danger with bishop f5 is actually just bishop e4. 
Because if the bishop comes to e4 and then rook h8, there's mate on h1. So all of a sudden, like, this is a problem. So I went bishop takes f5 because I could not allow bishop e4. Um, and after queen takes f5, I went knight e1. Very, very passive move, I know, but the point is I need to try and get my queen, queen over to some of these light squares to cover some of them because if they're not covered, I'm in really big trouble. Black played rook h8, um, and now I played queen f3, trying to trade these queens and again negate some of the light square pressure and the mating threats because now I can deal with queen h3 with queen g2. Or in fact, I might even be able to take on d5, but queen g2 is a little bit safer. Um, so after queen f3, I actually was su genuinely surprised by black's move because when I was calculating these lines, the move I was actually worried about was queen e4. I thought queen e4 was a super, super strong move. Point being that my knight is kind of frozen defending this queen, and if so if I want to untangle, I need to take it. But if I take it, strangely enough, after queen takes e4, d takes e4, my pawn in f2 is backward and I can't do anything with my pawn majority. And now my knight is really struggling for a square. Uh, I can't go to d3 or f3. And if I try to go knight g2, black can actually just play g5 and, again, lock my knight out of the game. And so... I actually thought this would be a really, really interesting way to play. And now black could even consider doubling rooks and trying to checkmate on h1 in some lines. So I just thought there was a lot of danger in this type of position after queen e4. Um, but I think my opponent was still having very aggressive, aggressive intentions with the queens on the board. So he actually didn't go for this. He went queen g5, which is also very reasonable. Um, just keeping an eye on my g3 pawn. Uh, e3 pawn. Uh, my queen is kind of tethered to the king side right now because I have to worry about um, sacrifices here. I played b takes a6, um, releasing the tension. It's always controversial whether you should release the tension or not. Um, one could argue that I could have played knight d3 and developed. Um, that probably would have been a more responsible move, rushing the knight to f4. Um, but for some reason, I thought I should relieve the tension. It was probably a mistake. After b takes a6, rook takes a6. Now we see some of the issue, um, which is that um, this a pawn is potentially weak. And now uh, black can actually think, consider switching the rook to a8 and just pressuring the a pawn. So it was really a poor decision to release the tension there because it just gave black a target to play with um, totally unnecessarily. Um, there has been actually talk in previous videos I've done about, um, you know, the pawns on the same square as the opponent's bishop. And in this case, again, I don't mind it. I don't mind that my, my kingside pawns are on the same square as the opponent's bishop because it does limit the scope of that bishop. Um, but at the same time, I do have to worry about some sacrifices. So I have to take very, very good care of my kingside. And now that I have to also attend to the queen side, um, I think I panicked a little bit. I started with knight d3, um, centralizing that knight, um, thinking about knight f4. Um, and black played rook h a8. And then I realized, oh my god, my a a4 pawn is attacked. What do I do? And um, here I think I made a pretty key mistake. Um, I played knight c5. Um, Knight c5 just misses the mark because after rook 6, a7 just retreating, um, now b6 is a threat and the a pawn is lost. And the other problem with it is that uh, if I go a5, black can actually just go b6 because I'm actually pinned. Um, I can't actually take on b6. A better move in this position instead of knight c5 would have actually been rook a, b1. Point being is that I attack this B, B pawn right away, and you know I'm happy to trade this A pawn for this B pawn. So Black would probably go B6, and in this position I can go Knight F4. And you see the difference here is that I'm actually attacking a pawn on D5 um, while the A4 pawn is being attacked, and you know Black's not going to be able to just you know take the A4 pawn for free. 
And so you could play a move like rook a5, but then I have rook b5, and again, I'm re renewing this threat on the pawn. And if black considers a move like bishop takes f4, um, I actually have e takes f4, and again, I'm hitting this queen on g5, and now that the bishop has traded on f4, my rook's actually hitting c7. So that was a very important move, and I just I think I just panicked and played knight c5 too quickly, and it's just bad, because after knight c5, rook goes back, I'm just in trouble. So I went a5 here because I saw that the a pawn was lost, and I thought, okay, at least... Um, Maybe it's better uh, to give give up the A pawn, but have um, black actually uh, have an isolated B pawn. So after A5, um, B6 is the way to win the pawn. I went knight B3 back, at least so that black has to take on A5, and maybe now I have an extra file to work with and a weak C pawn to play with. But actually, the bishop is doing a great job protecting this pawn, and an A pawn is actually extremely dangerous because... Knights are very, very bad at guarding rook pawns. So it's actually uh, a problem now where certain end games are just losing for me. So I played rook a4 to stop in its tracks. Um, and after bishop b4, um, very nice move. It actually just cuts my rook off a little bit and it's almost like trapped. I went knight c5, trying to take up some squares in the game now. I mean, again, I'm a pawn down, but I'm trying to, just trying to make it difficult on black now. And black went rook h8 back. And I think this move, this whole sequence kind of highlights the problems in my position because black can really play on both fronts. The h file is always going to be a little bit of a problem. And now that I'm just down a pawn on the queen side, I always have to worry about the a file being a problem. So... Being a pawn down, it's actually it feels even worse to just defend this position. It's very difficult. I went knight d3 trying to chase the bishop. And after bishop d6, I went rook c a1. Again, just trying to create some counterplay. The rook went back to a8. And then I went king g2, um, which I thought was a good move, tucking my king on a, on, onto the light square and also covering the g3 pawn so that maybe my queen could move away at some point. c6 was played, very good move, um, just defending the d5 pawn, and now the queen is actually free to roam. Um, and now I went rook c1, attacking you know what may be considered a new weakness, but it's very easy to defend, and black just played rook a6. You can see here, I'm just making one move threats. I don't have any counterplay of my own. It's very, very difficult to get stuff going. Yeah, so I was getting a little frustrated. I played rook b1, again, a little, just waiting a little bit, you know, eyeing rook b7. And now queen e7 stops my idea from getting in there. And then rook a1 back. You see, I'm just waiting for black to do something. Queen e6. King f1, more waiting. Rook a7, king e2. I mean, you, king e2 is maybe not the most elegant move, but again, I'm just waiting. Um, bishop c7, and now knight c5. Queen e7, king f1. And you can see, I'm just I'm just sitting on the pitch. I'm just, I can't do anything. I'm just trying to defend passively. Just see what happens. I think that's the best approach here. Rook b8, king g2. Rook a8, rook c1, rook b4. Okay, so now black is making some progress. And the point is here that if I trade the rooks, um, now this b pawn, um, uh, the, the a pawn becomes a b pawn, the rook gets the a file. Um, I don't really want to trade here, so I went rook c a1, at least so I can trade on my own terms. Because now if I back up with rook a2, there's a4, and this pawn is marching a little bit. Um, so I went rook c a1, rook takes, takes, and now bishop d6. And you can see black has made some progress here. Um, my knight does not have this outpost anymore. It's very, it's actually more difficult to defend with one rook in some ways because now I can't attack the a5 pawn multiple times. So I went knight d3 back. And you can see this a pawn now is not is very difficult to control. 
Black played queen b7, shifting gears, and now trying to invade. Um, you can see queen b3 is a square to invade, queen b5. So both these squares are, uh, are very sensitive. Um, and because of that, I went knight f4, trying to get my knight into a position now where maybe I can try and sacrifice somewhere or you know create some phantom threats. Um, another thing I was thinking about is maybe queen g4 and then knight h5 check. Um, and you know, to be honest, I really wouldn't mind bishop takes f4 in certain situations because after queen takes f4, I might get queen e5 check. So those are the types of things I was looking at. But at the same time, um, it's kind of funny because I could have had this knight on f4 like 15 moves ago when I blundered my a pawn, right? I went knight c5 very quickly, um, and I really should have just went to f4 as, as soon as possible. So just missed opportunities on my part. Bishop takes f4 was actually played here, and I was shocked by this move because I thought, why? You're, now I might have perpetual check chances. So I played queen takes f4 pretty gleefully, and I was like, wow, okay. Now my queen's kind of active. I could kind of work this position a little bit. And after queen e7, I had a long think um, because I was like, this seems like it might be holdable. Like my rook is, you know, guarding this, is, is blockading the a5 pawn. The king would have to be involved for the rook to be pushed or the queen would have to be involved, for, excuse me, for the pawn to be pushed. And I thought, okay, maybe I have some chances here. Um, and my one thought process was, Black might be threatening queen e4 check and trying to figure out what the evaluation of that end game was was pretty difficult because on the flip side, um, after an exchange on e4, uh, my rook is tied down. If I move my rook, the a pawn just runs. Um, the other thing, though, would be that after that exchange, the king would have to walk again all the way to the b5 square to get that pawn rolling. And I was wondering if I would be able to get counterplay with my king in the meantime on the king side. So I thought, I'm not so sure there's a great way to stop queen e4, um, but maybe I can try to get my king in. So I was like, I'm going to allow it. And I played g4. And my idea with g4 was to play g5 and take a little bit more space on the, uh, on the king side. So black played queen e4 check and... I took, and after takes, I was trying to figure out whether I can hold this endgame or not. Um, and it was tough to figure out, but I thought it was my best chance. I went king g3, trying to nudge my king up. Black played g5, very, very good move, cutting my king out of the game. And now I played f3, trying to get my king back in the game. And after e takes f3, king takes f3, it's kind of a race now to see who's going to get their king, um, who's going to get their king over to these meaningful squares first. I thought I was going to get there first, but then the question was, what what happens next? And do I run out of moves? Because again, my rook on a4 is kind of frozen. So king f6, e4 was I played. No, I didn't play king e4 because I thought I run out of moves. If king e6. Now my rook can't move because then the a pawn runs. And if my king moves, now I actually thought black has two interesting ways to proceed. Um, and I thought one of them was king d5. But I thought also, also that another one might be f5. And maybe I have to worry about an outside g pawn. So I played e4 to tamp down on potential f5 moves. King e6, king e3, king d6, king d3. And I felt pretty good here because my king is coming over to the uh, to the um, to the queen side pretty effectively, and this king can't get over to b5 before my king does. So I thought, not bad. But now black played c5, and this is actually a very very um, tricky situation because uh, now I have to make a tough decision, and I must say I was in time trouble here. Um, the question is, do I? Take on c5. Um, if I do that, then this king gets to the b5 square very quickly. Do I push d5? If I do that, the king might come to e5 and come in and invade. Or do I just keep the status quo and wait and just play king c4 and wait for black to take on d4? Very, very tough decision. 
I played D5 because I thought, okay, giving myself a protected pass pawn makes sense. I could still go King C4. And black now played King E5. And I'm pretty much obliged to move my king up the board with King C4. So I went King C4. And after king takes e4, we have the critical position of the game. Critical position of the game. Um, I actually played king takes c5, check. And this is actually a blunder. Um, so I'm going to give you five seconds to pause the video and try to find out white to play and hold. White to play and hold. It's very, very... Um, uh, it's it's kind of counterintuitive, but um, white has a better move than king takes c5. All right, hopefully you got a chance to pause the video. Um, there aren't too many options besides king takes e5, so maybe you got it by process of elimination. But the move is actually rook a1, surprisingly. And the point is now you try to check the king from uh, behind and actually show that your d pawn which is the furthest advanced pawn in the position, is actually the most important. So the point is, is that rookie one check is a major threat, and black can't just go chasing for the g4 pawn because I start to push my d pawn. So the best move is actually king e5, trying to get back to d6 and blockade. Note that if I take on c5, there's rook c8 check cutting me off. So rookie f1 is actually the move, and the point is now you're hitting f7, and you're threatening rook f5 check. Um, so king d6 is, uh, needs to be played. But now after rook takes f7, white has enough counterplay. Um, you're threatening rook f6 check, maybe king takes d5. There's just enough here. After a4, you give the check, king e7, rook e6 check, king d7, and now king takes. And after a3, give a few checks, and the rook can actually come back and actually catch the a3 pawn in time. So this position is very, very amazing to me because uh, I would not have thought it was a draw, but it actually winds up being a draw. And note that here, the king can start to run towards the a pawn, but I'll just uh, give my rook up for it and have my own g pawn to push up the board. So it was actually a draw with best play, but that retreating move was difficult uh, to see. And it's often the retreating moves that actually are key moves, um, I'm actually noticing. So something to keep in mind. The problem with my move, king takes c5, um, uh, which I played after king takes c4. In this very position, I played king takes c5. And the issue is, is that now my king just gets cut off from the action with the very strong king e5 first, securing the opposition, right, because it was check. But now black's threat is actually rook c8 check, just cutting me off from the game. And so I went king c6 trying to move up the board um, because I saw rook c8 as a threat. But now black goes rook d8. And in addition to attacking the d5 pawn, there's also this rook d6 check moves, which forces my king further away from the action. So I'm kind of forced to take on a5. But now there's rook d6 check, and this just wins because I can't go back to c5 because rook takes d5, picking off my rook. And so I have to step up here. But after rook takes d5, I can't trade rooks because the pawn end game is totally losing. And my king is so cut off that I can never actually cross the plane and get in. So I actually, after rook takes d5, resigned. Tough game because I thought I had something um, in the opening, but it turned out I didn't. I defended reasonably even after getting a pawn down. And then um, I had my chance to draw in the rook end game, but wasn't able to hold. So I pretty much had th three different phases where there were opportunities, but I just kind of got outplayed. And um, yeah, it just it wasn't a good showing, but um, a good lesson about the Ragozin for me and. Uh, Definitely had to go back to the drawing board and figure out another way to challenge that system. All right, um, that's it for this one. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, please like and or subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support the Road to Grandmaster journey, please do so by making a, a donation in the PayPal description below. Thanks. Take care.